I wish to bid you a very warm welcome, all participants, and a, a very good afternoon in this webinar on 3D reconstructions for storytelling and understanding uh, that we are uh, giving under the hashtag of connecting archaeology. So my name is Henk Alkemaal. I am uh, a senior specialist in historical landscapes at uh, the heritage, cultural heritage uh, uh, agency of the Netherlands. And I'm also a member of the board of Karare, which is organizing this uh, webinar. Please, Kate, can you give the next slide? So Karare, as is an association that aims to advance professional practice and foster appreciation of the digital archaeological heritage. And this webinar on using 3D reconstructions is the third in a series that Karari is planning under the hashtag connecting archaeology. And today we are aiming to explore some of the ways uh, the 3D reconstructions are being used for storytelling and to aid understanding. And our speakers will give uh, uh, some fine examples. First of all, some housekeeping. This webinar will be recorded, but all lines and videos will be, uh, the lines will be muted and the videos will be off for the participants. Um, if you have any questions, please, write them down in the Zoom Q&A, uh, because we will have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the webinar. And uh, you can use the Zoom chat uh, to introduce yourself to the other participants and for general discussions and links. The next slide, please. Okay. Um, we are delighted to have two uh, great speakers in this webinar. Uh, first of all, Catherine and Cassidy of the Open Virtual Worlds team, University of St. Andrews, who will uh, talk uh, with us about dissemination methods for 3D historical virtual environments. And we have Daniel Platings, Visual Dimension, uh, and he will talk about interactive storytelling in virtual worlds. So I think this is, uh, they are fine speakers and, and we'll go on with the next please, Kate. And then we start with Daniel uh, with interactive storytelling in virtual worlds. He will introduce himself shortly at the beginning of his presentation. So. Without further delay, I want to hand over to Daniel. Please, Daniel. Hello, good morning, everybody from Belgium. My name is uh, Daniel Platings, and uh, I am from the company uh, Visual Dimension in Belgium. So we are a private company that's already working for 25 years in cultural heritage. And we are focused on innovation and so in this way, we are doing not only European projects, but also commercial projects. And uh, next slide, please. And so in this way, we uh, try to combine, in fact, research and science and technology uh, with uh, visualization, with uh, visualization in games technology. And we do that, in fact, in a documented and in a traceable way. Um, what we reconstruct, in fact, are sites, our uh, periods in time, and many reconstructions that we make are even multi-period, so we make not only a 3D reconstruction, but even a 4D reconstruction, uh, which uh, comprises, in fact, uh, not only buildings, but also objects, museum objects, other objects, landscape, and we try to make it appealing through water, weather, vegetation, living animals, etc. So we really build virtual worlds um, in which we integrate also intangible heritage 
And that brings us in fact to the topic of today, which is we use these virtual worlds for VR storytelling. We use these virtual worlds uh, to tell in fact, the story of a certain place, of a certain uh, society. Uh, and also we can make that uh, quite uh, appealing to gamification. So we can put some game elements in there. And that also holds that we um, try to work with 3D in a quite innovative way as we work in most cases with groups. Huh? So that means we try to do VR for groups, huh? group VR. And um, we already work for more than 10 years with contactless interaction, which is quite handy in a museum. But in these days with COVID and so on, it's even more uh, obvious that this is quite an important uh, solution that we have worked on for many uh, years. So we work uh, in commercial projects, but also in European projects. And uh, like now, we are also in working in this competence center for the conservation of cultural heritage uh, that is uh, where I'm responsible for the VR storytelling. Yes, next slide, please. Um, so we reconstruct not only landscapes, standing monuments, archaeological monuments, and that means also that we have to digitize a lot of objects or buildings or museum objects and or archaeological artifacts and turn them into the real object in this environment. And this whole process of how we do that, we keep a record of that in blogs that are uh, open to the public so that they can see also the kind of kitchen, the kind of backyard of the reconstruction result. Next slide, please. So virtual reconstruction is something that needs to be considered as a form of 3D digitization of cultural heritage, because it is in fact showing objects, showing a reality of the past. The, we, we don't show uh, uh, something that is fiction, we show something that is reality, although it may be doesn't exist anymore or exists in a damaged or incomplete way, but we try to reconstruct, in fact, this fourth dimension, the time dimension uh, in the past. And so we do that in interactive virtual reality. We try to do that scientifically correct, visually appealing, uh, and making a believable, enjoyable way in a cost-effective way. So that means, in fact, that quality is a very important issue, a very important aspect of this uh, reconstruction process. And once we have these virtual worlds, once we have this high quality virtual reconstruction, we use it as a kind of gateway to interactive uh, storytelling. Next slide, please. It's maybe good to uh, show that there are beyond those um, um, the visualization in uh, game technologies and game engines. In fact, that there is uh, not only some technical evolution there, but also a real content revolution there. Uh, technically, we have evolved over the last 10 years immensely. In fact, we don't render anymore. Render means that you calculate an image like you see the top image there. Uh, that's an image that has been calculated eight years ago, and that took half an hour to calculate. Now, today, we visualize that in real time, which is the bottom image that you see, in about 1 60th of a second. So that means we do that in 100,000 times faster, and that is an evolution over eight years, which is, of course, done by graphical uh, hardware in your computer, which is done by uh, good 3D digitization uh, and uh, uses all kinds of uh, techniques, which I won't go into detail here. The other uh, big revolution behind that is, in fact, that the sources to make these things, in fact, now are all online. Before, you had to be an expert that was going to libraries and had access to certain documents and to certain knowledge, and, in fact, was studying his whole life within, let's say, libraries or so. Now we can access these sources 
in not only in digital libraries, but also we can search them. The very important thing is the search engine that you can find images and videos, etc., cetera, and, and 3D objects in a, quite a quick way. And um, even uh, digitization of documents and even OCR uh, uh, of documents, even handwritten documents. Now, recently there was a software uh, um, released from uh, in, in the Netherlands for uh, OCRing handwritten 17th century text. All these things, in fact, open up sources that help us in doing this uh, virtual reconstruction. Uh, next slide, please. So we try to bring together what we know of the past. We cannot reconstruct the past. That's impossible. But by bringing together everything we know about that past, we can try to make a, vir a virtual world that, in fact, assembles all our knowledge and shows the most probable uh, solutions, the most probable uh, uh, situation, in fact, that we think was there in the past. And so we use text, we use iconography, archaeology, a lot of supporting sciences. We look at experimental archaeology where they try out to find out how things work and how things were done, and which is sometimes shown in historical parks. Uh, uh, and there is also a scientific methodology on how to bring all these different, sometimes uh, conflicting sources together in one solution that we uh, visualize. And when we visualize that, uh, then we also need a lot of 3D objects, assets, and not everything we make. And like you see the two drawings there and the drawing from the 16th century and the visualization in the 3D. The tree, for example, we buy. It's an oak tree that we buy. We don't make the oak tree. So in this way, we uh, assemble from many different sources, not only objects, but also effects, like you see the reflection in the water, the clouds in the air. All these effects are things we buy. Huh? Typically, an oak tree like this is costing 30 euros. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so we, we look at a lot of iconography, like, for example, the, the right-hand image from the Rex Museum helps us in reconstructing an interior of our bakery that we uh, have here, and uh, one of the houses uh, that we will show here. And in, in fact, in this bakery, uh, the interior contains a lot of museum objects, but also contains objects that come from uh, iconography, from paintings, for example, from the Rex Museum. And uh, to show this bakery, Next slide, please. We have uh, put a lot of interior and a lot of uh, objects there that help us to tell a whole story, not only of the bakery, but also ge more generally of life in the 17th century. Next slide, please. And of course, we rely on written texts, on studies, on a lot of other uh, sources that we all bring together to make a visualization. So let me take you very briefly through the process of this reconstruction. Next slide, please. And to come to an image like this, which is a reconstruction of the village of Enamo, where I'm physically also sitting now today, but which is one of the major projects we're already doing for um, 25 years now and uh, have made in different time periods, different reconstructions of it. Next slide, please. This visualization is a visualization of this map. Exactly what you see here on the map, it, you just saw in 3D visualized. Next slide, please. And so the buildings and structures and parcels that you see indicated there. Next slide, please. One by one can be referred here on the map. And so in this way, we have, for example, used the GIS system to come to the exact parcels. So all the parcels are really very precise. They're not just drawn. They're, they're really very precise from maps and from all the uh, inf map information that we have. Next slide, please. 
and then we bring together many different sources. Huh? We, we buy sources, we model uh, objects like the houses. Uh, we look at historical parks, like for example, the bee stall. Uh, we have uh, taken in fact from the historical park in Bokrek. We, uh, there are museum objects even in the picture. Uh, and we all bring that together, together with iconography, archeology, span standing monuments. The church is still standing there. And uh, next slide, please. This brings us in fact to a living world. This is not an image, but this is, a, yeah, you can play the video. Uh, the, this is a virtual world that you can interactively walk through and explore and find out and even jump over hedges if you want. Here is the museum object that is standing in the museum, etc. So. This is a, a, fully, a completely interactive world that can be used to tell a, a complete story huh? with the bees even and the bee hives uh, there. Yeah, you can take the next slide, please. And so we will reconstruct this area two by two kilometers. So it's a complete virtual world. It's not a small thing, it's a very, um, a large world, the, the 3D file to visualize a six gigabyte uh, in total. And so that means also that we use a lot of technical techniques, in fact, to optimize this and to make this possible to show this virtual world at least at 60 frames per second. Next slide, please. So how do people uh, use this? In fact, you can use this as a guide. Uh, and has explained uh, this, in fact, and walked through this virtual world. And in fact, here you see the situation, uh, uh, the presentation uh, set up, in fact, in the uh, visitor center, where you see out of the window, you see the archeological site that is reconstructed on the screen. So that means, in fact, as a guide, you walk through it, you explain it, you can refer even to the site out outdoors uh, and so on. Uh, as a uh, visitor, in fact, you can do the same. Uh, you get, uh, for example, a games controller, you can walk through it and in this way, explore this virtual world. Next slide, please. And we do this in several locations. Uh, this is in the museum. And uh, in this way, um, you can tell the story like you would do as a normal guide, but it's a virtual world. It's a virtual walk. Uh, uh, you're all sitting there, but the whole group, and you can explain this. And the visitors in the museum just sit there the same and go, walk themselves, in fact, through the virtual world. You see, this is a COVID picture. Everybody's sitting very nicely, widely spread from each other. Uh, uh, so that's uh, how we use it. And next slide, please. So uh, to come back to our bakery, and uh, so how do we make the stories? Uh, for example, we, we get inspired by uh, paintings like this painting from Jan Steen uh, depicting a baker and his wife and the painting was made for their uh, wedding in fact. And based on that, we have made in fact for the bakery and we do that for all the, the things we reconstruct, a backstory. So a backstory of a uh, a, a small house bought by a young couple with two uh, small children. In fact, too small to be a bakery, but nevertheless. Uh, and, and so in this way, we, we, we make this backstory to use, in fact, as uh, or, or to augment, in fact, the realism of what we show uh, in, in, in the picture. And so it's full of references to paintings, to museum objects, and as a virtual guide, as a guide, in fact, you do a virtual tour uh, and do the storytelling and walk through it as if you explore it yourself, like in a museum, uh, you, you get the stories through the objects. So you can pick up an object. And if you pick up an object, you hear an audio file that explain or that gives you a small uh, story. And next slide, please. And in this way, of course, you cannot only show how the baker is doing, but you can give a wider context uh, of the, uh, the life in the 17th century. Uh, next slide, please. And, and, and in this way, um, come up with uh, many different practices with objects 
the things that people recognize, eh, like the pretzels of today, they were already used in the 17th century, but a little bit different, uh, etc. So you can link you know, what we do when we use this, uh, both for individuals and both as a guide uh, doing a virtual tour, is making the link to today and link to uh, situations and objects that people know. Next slide, please. So the objects themselves are used in a uh, way to tell stories. Huh? So this is an old uh, picture showing the interface with the Kinect and that you can grab an object with your two hands. Now we use the games controller and with the buttons which are on there to select the objects when you're close by. Huh? Next slide, please. And so, for example, if we have this setting, this reconstruction of the city of Aardenburg in the Netherlands, in the 17th century, they were in fact at the brink of uh, a siege of a, by the French army and they put their cannons ready and you can take a grenade from the, 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 the set of grenades which is there and look it from all sides. Next slide, please. And even fire the cannon. So you see how the grenade is used and so on. And you think, oh, okay, this is, a, this is fun, of course. This, uh, this is what the children also like to see. But on the other hand, we're showing, in fact, for, uh, cultural heritage, how you fire a, gren a grenade like that, because it is not done anymore today, because it's really extremely dangerous. So nobody is allowed even to do it practically, physically today. So we have to do it virtually and show it in, in this way. Next slide, please. And so we use, in fact, the backdrop of this uh, military uh, camp with the barracks and the, and the soldiers and mounting the cannons and so on to tell the wider story of the city, the city that is being sieged, in fact, in the 17th century by the French army, uh, something which is commemorated uh, this year, uh, it's 350 years ago. And so in this way, uh, the commemoration um, is supported, in fact, by this visualization that shows the situation the day before the battle uh, uh, in, in, uh, and, and links, in fact, to the activities which will happen this year uh, on the commemoration of that uh, siege. Next slide, please. The same holds for you're really in the in the battlefield and you see how the cannons are towed up uh, the, the 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 slope huh? and so in this way you see the wider uh, story of the 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 city and the wider story which is part of the uh, the the start in fact of the young republic uh, of the Netherlands in fact and and you can tell the wider story uh, with a lot of connections to objects to uh, things like this. Uh, and, and, and so that's the way the guides will use this because this is a system which we're still finishing and which will become operational in April. Next slide, please. So it's not only about the interactivity and yeah, how does this work and how was this done practically, but it's also used the, the whole virtual worlds and the objects is used as the backdrop, in fact, as a hook to connect with the stories, the wider stories, which are there. Next slide, please. And the same holds for the church. And huh? this was a Catholic church, which was then taken by the young uh, Protestant community uh, there uh, and turned into a uh, Protestant church. Next slide, please. And showing this uh, the church, in fact, from the inside, uh, this uh, in, in an interactive way, we link to the uh, Protestant community of today, uh, because the Protestant community of today is the owner and of the building and exploits the building. And so in this way, it's not only about showing 3D and telling the past, it's also about connecting with the local uh, community. Next slide, please. And again, you walk through the 3D, uh, uh, just follow the YouTube links uh, in the document that we will make available and you will see the different videos to, to see it, it all happening. But you walk through it as a guide and then you explain, in fact, this is happening in the church itself. And so this is visualized in the church itself. 
Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, Daniel, to interrupt, but could you work towards the red? I'm working towards the end. I'm, I'm, I'm nearly there, yes. Right. And so in, in this way, uh, the, 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 um, when you pick up an object, you hear also the story if you're as an individual uh, using this VR application. Next slide, please. So the one final uh, example that I give to finish uh, is uh, another project we are working on at this moment. And it's about, uh, in fact, basically the same story about the young uh, uh, Republic of the Netherlands, uh, and which is Fort Lillo. Fort Lillo is just in front of Antwerp and was part of the, let's say, the economic blocking of uh, the port of Antwerp most of the wealth, in fact, and the booming of the Amsterdam in the 17th century is due to this blocking, in fact, of Antwerp and uh, this uh, economic war, in fact, that happened. The, the fort in its whole existence of 200 years has only fought once, but it was doing this economic war every day. And what you see, in fact, is the reconstruction. It's work in progress now, but this uh, reconstruction shows you, in fact, uh, the international border, the, the toll station, in fact, where the ships are lying. And, and so, next slide, please. So 1K is in fact for the normal revitalization uh, uh, of the, of the uh, or, or the goods for the, for the fort itself. But the next slide, please. What you see here is not just the harbor it's on, it's really international. Uh, border. Eh? It's, it's a border between the Netherlands and uh, the, the low countries and the, 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 the Belgium today. Eh? And, uh, and the house that you see is in fact a toll station. So telling, the, making the reconstruction helps in fact to tell these kind of things. How do you tell an economic war? This is how you do it. And that, that's what we try to do uh, through this uh, reconstruction. So that's my story for today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel. It's, it's an amazing story, You're beautiful and interesting. Thank you so much. Let's go on to our next presenter, Catherine M. Please go ahead. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Hank. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Catherine Ann from the research group Open Virtual Worlds out of the School of Computer Science at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Uh, we're a multidisciplinary group, which includes programmers, historians, digital modelers, museum experts, archaeologists, geophysicists, digiters, digitizers, um, who all add depth and richness and a wider scope to our digital projects. Our research centers around how emergent digital technologies can be used for preservation and promotion of cultural natural heritage and focusing on accessible methods for interoperability and reuse. And this can be through immersive experiences within museums, online virtual museums and archives, smartphone applications, virtual reconstructions, 3D models of objects, et cetera, et cetera. Slide, please. So we're able to make these virtual reconstructions. At, oops, sorry, next slide. I had jumped a slide. <laughs> There you go. We're able to make these virtual reconstructions due to partnerships um, and funded projects. So some of the use cases that I'll talk to today and use for demonstrations are from the CNA project, Cupido, Stratus projects, uh, plus others that have been included into cluster projects such as Five and Hive. We're working towards a digital center of excellence that distills innovations from these cluster projects with the intention to increase awareness and transnational cooperation, creating a Northern Heritage Network for digital community heritage. Next slide, please. So our motivations for using virtual reconstructions as mediums for informal learning have been influenced by these various projects. So many of the Northern focused objectives were for remote tourism with either goals towards more eco-conscious tourism through less football at a site, or sometimes the opposite to generate interest in audiences. So they'll actually go out into the landscape. In many of these instances, the sites are no longer, um, they appear presently as they once did. So they benefit from an enhancement to disseminate the historical research. Oh, thank you. 
that's good. Um, accessibility is another main motivation for virtual reconstructions, uh, which are able to include a majority more a majority of audiences, despite spatial or temporal barriers. Actual locations of sites may be remote, precarious to visit, um, or protected, so physical visitation is not possible. And the digital domain allows for adaptable storytelling, as digital can be edited, reworked, repre represented, while still keeping original edits and versions. We have many reconstructions that are either going through revamps because the software for building and rendering them um, has advanced so they can appear more current or new research and narratives mean uh, new interpretation or new structures um, or changing of structures. Next slide. Thanks. So as centers for informal learning, museum and heritage organizations are perfect for offering experiential and collaborative learning scenarios. The methods in which you create those scenarios are vast and evolving and don't necessarily require physical attendance. So personal devices that are constantly getting faster and more robust um, are causing a disruption to how heritage has traditionally been used for learning. So anyone who uses smartphones or tablets and even laptops and desktop computers are expecting content to be offered through omni-channel approaches, so in which they can access content in the way they prefer or in channels they prefer. So digital domain allows this flexibility and can cater to platforms that various audience groups uh, will be more familiar with. Next slide. Thanks. So um, the methods in which some of our use cases um, have engaged users, users in formal learning are what I'll be talking about today. So I first want to detail the elements that go into research-based virtual reconstructions, which Daniel has touched on, um, and which are multidisciplinary, which was explained. So I'll break the methods for dissemination up by the points of engagement then. So as in from where engagement occurs, as opposed to the hardware, the, uh, the types of um, things that you would use to interact with them because a lot of that hardware actually cross, crosses now from home to on the go and remote to the museum. So I'll start with museum-based dissemination and then to remote museum without walls exhibits and then museum at home methods of learning. So next slide. So virtual reconstructions are visual representations of research. For our group, we like to think of making virtual reconstructions as an academic audit. So since you're virtually physically building something based on research, you can find out very quickly when there's a lack of research. So primarily we use historical texts, documents, maps, um, which you can see blown in this photo, blown up and laid down on the terrain to scale. So our modeler can then build structures upwards. Other expert and local knowledge is absolutely imperative to obtain because although stories can sometimes contain truth and fiction, um, it creates a dynamic interpretation, which is what you're doing when you create a re reconstruction. Hard data, including terrain surveys, modern aerial capture of sites, add to ongoing research. And then the addition of 3D artifacts um, into reconstructions give ori original context to those physical objects, um, which may be celebrated in the museum uh, collection as like, you know, the main really special object, but actually when you put it back into the reconstruction of its context, it could have been a mundane, normally commonly used object. Um, and then adding characters, environmental effects, audio assets um, adds to authenticity and realism of a project. Next slide. So just as a quick example of that 3D putting objects back into the reconstruction, um, the focus here is the chair. Um, this chair is from the collections of time span in Helmsdale, Scotland. The physical object is made out of bog wood. So wood pulled out of a bog and assembled into a chair, um, which is really quite sweet. So mostly, and it was most likely used in the township of um, in the 1800s. So this digital version of this object lives in various mediums, um, but here it's back in its potential context in the reconstruction of that township. So next slide. So it's a video. 
So like I mentioned before, virtual reconstructions are visual representations of research. Um, this is an example of Kalanish 10. So stone circle, um, which the main Kalanish stone circle on Lewis is um, just part of one of several well-known stone sites of interest on the island. So as you can see, the stones for 10 have fallen over, um, but through photogrammetry of the stones, um, modeling them to be complete and then standing them back up uh, demonstrates the current academic understanding of how these stone circles might have looked. So suddenly when you put them upright, you can analyze their significance, the significance of each stone, the significance of them all together, and then their relevance to other stone circles within the landscape. So next slide. So now talking about methods in which this, all this information that's been pulled together can be presented. So we'll start with more traditional museum-based dissemination. Uh, so within the walls of a museum. Thank you. So we've been developing immersive interactive displays in museums for well over a decade and have leveraged novel technologies for further innovation. So this has included projections, gaming technologies, gesture-based tracking, um, and further advancements with VR displays. So uh, an efficient and adaptable method for dissemination in museums is based off of a, or it's a template we've created using VR head-mounted displays paired with other visual aids, such as a monitor um, that you can see above that compiles multiple types of exhibit elements into a single interactive. You can you actually see um, in that photo is going through a menu system. This uh, install is in the Tomatul and Glen Levitt Discovery Center in Tomatul. Um, and actually, I don't know if anybody can tell, but that's being tested by our first minister of Scotland. Um, it's a multi-level, um, including two virtual reconstructive reconstruction tours, um, one based on scenes that follow a historical narrative that aligns with the physical exhibitions within the museum. So as part, and it continues you on to the physical exhibition. And the other one is a open exploration level for user-led discovery of the reconstruction. Slide. Next slide, thank you. Um, this kind of VR exhibit template is run as a program, so technically can be mobile and transported. So just for fun, this is then it being shown off of the Helmsdale Highland Games, the time span VR exhibit at a local expo pavilion. Um, and part of the immersion is that fish that you can see in the background is actually supposed to be worn on top of the VR headset. So you're in fact wearing a fish as you use in the interactive, which is all part of the, the topic that's being presented. Next slide. So Pix and Pixels, excuse me, at the Perth Museum and Art Gallery was an early gallery exhibition where the virtual reconstructions and digitized artifacts were as much of the focus as the physical artifacts on display. Two separate reconstructions were projected onto gallery walls and used Xbox controllers for interactivity. 360 degree scenes included interpretation related to different points of interest in the reconstruction. And one reconstruction had recently been an active archaeological excavation that summer. So new findings were then incorporated into the reconstruction. So then when um, the exhibition was um, made public, the volunteers were able to come back in from the exhibition excavation to visualize the site that they had been working on all summer and see the impact that they played and they made to reveal more of Scotland's history. Next slide. So museum without wall dissemination benefits from being out in the world, unrestrained from physical barriers and requiring just devices that maybe just need a good network service. But the biggest potential benefit is being able to maintain the sense of presence by being at a site and using technologies that show the site as it once was, but right in front of you. So uh, I'll start with a project that's a little bit older, but we developed over a year to make as accurate, um, academically as accurate as possible for the time period we chose. Um, you can play the video. And um, also with the, the remote mobile application that uh, allowed you to see the elements of reconstruction based on a geolocation in the modern city. So a few years ago, we reconstructed the Royal Mile 
in Edinburgh as the, of what it would have looked like in 1544 before the British attacked and burned most of the city. So the reconstruction was primarily based off a spy map, British spy map. They gave very detailed drawings of the city layout uh, prior to the impending invasion, which in was extremely beneficial for us. The foundations of the Royal Mile are still there today, but um, as you get a little bit closer in the video, you'll see a lot of the buildings are wooden buildings um, on the street then that are no longer there, which was replaced very smartly um, by stone buildings that are still there today. Um, so the reconstruction primary method of dissemination was a geolocation mobile app that you could track your location and select the nearest highlighted scene to explore. An intro video gave a bird's eye view of the area, which then led to a 360 degree scene with interpretation of hotspot points. Um, and it can either be full screen or using a VR headset for your phone. Um, so I'll let this play. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, you can go to the next slide. But that's Grass Market that's under the castle. That's still a very popular place today. So. Uh, with this menu, you can see that some of those uh, points are still recognizable if you're if anyone's familiar with Edinburgh, but some of those are absolutely are, are gone um, or nearly unrecognizable today. So next slide. So visualizing, oh, sorry visually allowing cross comparison between the real world and the virtual adds depth to understanding of the city changing through time. So using points of reference such as Arthur's Seat, the mountain in the background, well, volcanic plug in the background um, and St. Giles on the left, you can see present day Edinburgh is, um, next slide, is very different from Edinburgh in 1544. But there you can still see Arthur's Seat in the background and St. Giles poking up on the, the right-hand side, yeah, sorry. Um, the template for the geolocation app has been progressed and reused in multiple projects. If you go next. Excuse me, I had to clear my throat. Um, most recently for a city tour revamped city tour of Perth in Scotland with physical interpretation boards needing a revamp we understood or we undertook a reconstruction of Perth as it would have been in the 1400s and aligned them with points of reference that are still visible today. And as opposed to an app, QR codes were used uh, to open 360 degree interpretive tours for greater accessibility and ease of use. So no one had to download anything. Um, you could just use your network. Next city, or next city, next slide. So new developments in the Perth reconstruction included detailed historically accurate as possible characters um, in which users could interact and pose questions to um, those assets. Though assets are readily available, um, as Daniel said, for download or sale, and most often are fit for purpose, and we use a lot of them, um, to align with the authenticity of the reconstruction, some of the assets and characters uh, needed, needed to be developed more accurately. Um, this can be down, uh, you can model known individuals like the baker um, or modeling period accurate dress or even rigged actions for a specific profession. Next slide. And we're continuing this with a current project with Tremont Team Museum and Melrose who already have a fabulous virtual reconstruction of their Roman fort, but want to deploy it in the field when they facilitate walking tours for visitors to use on their own. Um, in contrast, there's not many points of reference for the Roman fort. As you can see, the outline in this um, screenshot, it's in a crop field. Um, it's very flat. You don't see any kind of stone outmarks or anything. It's just the, the outer landscape that you can use for reference. Um, but it's difficult to visualize a bustling fort that would have been occupied for 100 years with Roman soldiers. So being able to use reconstructions in the landscape or out in the field, as it were, um, bring a sense of presence and understanding that adds to a richness of learning that may not be available otherwise. Next slide. So finally, all museum without walls 
mobile applications can of course be used at home, but museum at home methods are specifically referring to learning at home. So as in you're not on the move, you can take the time, have a, have, have a sit, have a tea, um, and enjoy the experience without any kind of rush. Next slide. So to mention COVID, our prior methods of dissemination were shifted to more remote and personal device approaches, while previously our online use was mostly used for social archiving and, and uh, marketing and advertising, as in, as in using YouTube or Vimeo for sharing videos, photos to Facebook, creating tours for Round Me or Kula. However, with the restrictions, important shifted heavily onto accessible social platforms for facilitating, facilitating heritage experiences and informal learning at home. So in my opinion, this has now led to our virtual reconstructions being seen by the most amount of people, simply because of the great reach and sharing capabilities and live facilities of social media. Through live events, we've been able to teach digital skills, support knowledge, knowledge exchange across the sector and give a platform for experts to speak to their research in the form of walking tours. Um, so in this photo, this is Jackie Aiken, an archeologist from the Time Span Museum, uh, talking to an Iron Age reconstruction um, or Iron Age roundhouse settlement reconstruction in which the level is streamed live for instant investigation and exploration while she speaks. Uh, next slide. So, and then you can even compound this more of a live tour by having the local expert, and in this photo is Skuli Gunnarsson from Skuli Cluster in the east of Iceland. Um, he's able to stand pretty decent service, um, even though quite remote, at an archeological site while the reconstruction also being streamed and the feed is swapped between the two. So he can stand in actual locations, swap over to the reconstruction, all live, all from people sitting at home. Next slide. So, but even simply, Online virtual tours are incredibly effective for individually paced experiences, uh, which add layers of media and interpretation to serve as standalone exhibits that then can be embedded and shared as well. So, um, and not mentioned yet, but virtual reconstructions can also aid in visualizing in the not so pleasant past uh, that strides to evoke emotions so a learners can better empath empathize. <laughs> can't speak, empathize with an experience. Um, I'm using a recreation of a World War War prisoner of war camp, World War II, sorry, prisoner of war camp from the Highlanders Museums or created with the Highlanders Museums, um, where many captured allied forces were held during the war. Next slide, please. So very few detailed photographs exist from inside camps. So this reconstruction was made based on common elements found in most camps and then supplemented with written and oral histories. Uh, the idea was to demonstrate the restricted life led by captured soldiers, but still hint at the humanistic details that prove resilience, such as food gardens and the football pitch and prisoner of war made objects, such as jumpers and a marching drum. Next slide. And as another, uh, at home based virtual tour, I wanna to show how multiple reconstructions of a single heritage site can demonstrate change of use, value and significance for people over time. So Down Patrick Head in Ireland is, as the menu suggests, geologically significant, but has also held importance through the ages for different people. Uh, presently, there are remains from each of these different time periods in a bit of a mishmash of narratives at the site. So a reconstruction of each time period allows visitors to more comprehensively associate narratives with the visual representation and then back to then if they were even standing right in front of it as well. Uh, next slide, please. So in the example of Down Patrick Head, archaeological findings and historical research visualize a medieval settlement on the side of a very remote, rugged coastline, um, but with its church front and center in the middle of the community. Stories linked to St. Patrick are told through audio by, local, by a local storyteller um, set against geological formations, which then inspired the stories. Next. To then 
more recent history where the area was used as a lookout point for rogue aircraft during, during World War II, in which the station and the air aviation sign are still standing today. Next, please. Um, so in closing, just want to say that we're continuing, we constantly continuing development in new methods of dissemination, advancing upon feedback and requests for greater functionalities um, to continue present omni-channel methods for learning uh, through the medium of virtual reconstructions. We're developing accessible platforms in which live export tours and open exploration of the reconstructions can happen in group settings. So replicating school or walking tours, digital engagement by museums from outside museum walls was shown as a previously undervalued method of learning and engagement, but due to a major world disruption um, has caused innovation at an accelerated rate. And we're excited to see where virtual reconstructions can be used to create richer and immerse, more immersive informal learning within the heritage sector. Next slide. And so that's me. Um, if you'd like further to further explore any of the use cases I talked to today, you can check out our social um, social accounts and which can lead you to a bunch of links. And I think some links will be then incorporated into the slide deck of this presentation today. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Catherine and Anne, for an amazing presentation. Uh, I noticed there are uh, some questions, some in the chat and some in the Q&A. Uh, uh, please let me start with uh, a few in the Q&A. Uh, Ivan Kampanaren asked if you thought about um, uh, presenting these 3D reconstructions in the form of uh, indie games and publish it at uh, the relevant platforms in order to attract more audience and to uh, have them uh, well play with history. <laughs> I think this is for Catherine and probably as first. Yeah. Uh, yes, I'd absolutely love to. And um, it's all dependent as well with the project that it's from uh, too, because a lot of these reconstructions and um, are, are part of projects to then, uh, yeah, to be used in some way or some format. So then if it's as a example for further reach, then that's absolutely where um, that can end up as well. Um, sorry, my dog shaking in the background. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it, we've definitely talked about, we don't have anything on any of those platforms right, right now, but um, especially with the kind of similar to what Daniel's doing with the, the VR kind of group tour, um, that's definitely something that is based for lots of people using it, um, but under kind of the, the museum's terms, more of, you know, how they want to, to present it and, and give uh, different tours as well. Okay, thank you, I understand. And Daniel, are you planning to make games? <laughs> We're planning to make games. Yes, we are. Um, in, in this sense that um, when we do virtual reconstructions, we come across a lot of very good content and very good content that can be put in uh, a competitive and in a playable environment in the game. So we, we are already for some years working on ideas to implement that. And there was a, a question about VR and AR. Uh, one of the things we are working on is indeed an AR game that uh, can be played in on the location itself, but in that, indeed with the virtual uh, elements and the whole story that plays in the 17th century. So that's what we want to do, yes. But it's about the locus geni, yeah? so it's about the place. It's about, uh, of course, uh, there are very good games like Take Assassin's Creed and whatever. We don't have those budgets. We don't have those things. Uh, uh, so what we can do, in fact, is really do something on the location itself with a good story. And uh, that's definitely what we want to do, yes. Okay, thank you. 
I, I saw an, a question by uh, Marta Brescia, who uh, asks Catherine if she wants to, if she uh, wants to offer um, accessibility services for, for instance, visually or audially impaired people, and perhaps also language uh, interpretations. So, Catherine. Yeah, no, that is um, that's a really good uh, question and also point to bring up that, you know, we're talking about something that is inherently visual and that does not serve all of all <coughs> audiences either. Um, so we do like to incorporate some kind of um, audio descriptions if it's available or we create them or museum helps and creates them. Um, it's all kind of dependent on um, what we see, what the method that we're presenting, what is available within the method to then expand the accessibility. Um, and I would say pretty much the most common one would be the subtitles and then the audio description as well. Um, it's actually, yeah, it's, um, it's something that we've, you know, you research and you, and you work and you, um, ex and you experiment and then you realize, oh, we've missed something really big. Um, so it's been something that we've added and added into um, more and more in, into projects. And then as sometimes usually as the second, um, not, I don't want to say phase, but a version of like, okay, let's get these out. And then if we have different languages, sometimes, you know, we try to use different language and get that out as well. Um, it depends on the museum as well and what they, um, their audiences, they know as well. So if, not, if a museum knows that they actually get a lot of audience from you know maybe that speak three different languages we've done that where we've um had things translated and um text translated and audio translated so yeah okay thank you i noticed another very nice question uh from kate can you talk with historical persons <laughs> as a visitor Maybe can I do that? Yes. Um, I think today we have the technology um, to really make you talk with historical persons. We have done that already many years ago. Um, I was involved in a project in, in Montreal many years ago about that. But today with AI combined with speech generation, with uh, virtual avatars and so on, combined in fact that we can do it today of course this is something which is new which requires budget to do but on the other hand i think all the elements are more or less ready now to do that yes okay Catherine, you want to add something to that answer sure um i think it's well, and why I mentioned us working on characters as another element to bring an authentic or authenticity to the reconstructions is that then it adds, we're using it as an added layer of um, possible learning and different method of learning. Um, so we haven't, you know, I, I see it as well, same as Daniel, uh, progressing more with AI and, um, but even with the simplistic formulated you know set question like you see in you know video games or video where it's like here's your choices and you ask this question and you receive different answers um you know maybe based on the presentation of the person or how you think it you know where you want the conversation to go even that as a dynamic is um just adds layers to to the reconstruction um because that's something that we've seen where we really focused on the reconstruction itself and getting it as accurately as possible but like you saw in edinburgh there's no people in it um there were some assets and there were some some things but it was just it was just the building now or buildings um now that was a huge reconstruction uh and for that time period and predominantly just with one modeler so she worked very hard on that um but mm -hmm. you can see now when you look back that something's just off and it's mostly because people 
should be in there. Um, and so then with Perth, bringing an added layer of just being able to communicate with somebody and ask them questions about the profession or ask them questions about living in Perth or whatever it is, um, it kind of, it gives another element, added element to the experience. Okay, thank you. I see the time, time is running out. It has run out already. Uh, we have uh, many uh, more questions, um, but perhaps we can, if we uh, record the, the chats and the Q&A, we can uh, answer them. If you have your name uh, written down, we can uh, answer these questions at a later moment, because we're done for now. And I would like to thank everyone uh, for attending and Daniel and Catherine and for their beautiful presentations. The slide deck and the, the links will be made available. Uh, so I'd say have a nice day and hope we meet again at the next webinar.